I'm doing software by day and uh, by night I'm doing a bit of uh, machine learning, which is my interest. And uh, one of the things which uh, I just wanted to just share a bit of my experience with is uh, classifying duplicate questions with TensorFlow. And I think uh, for many of you who are already on Kaggle, I'm sure you have also attempted this particular Kaggle competition, uh, Quora Question Pairs, right? So it's going to be a short one, so I'm just going to plow through, uh, and then uh, we can ask questions later. So the, basically, the uh, problem challenge and approach is basically uh, to build a classifier that will determine if two questions are identical. Uh, and the key thing is that this labeled data set is a human labeled data set, right? So, uh, which also means that there's a bit of a background human uh, judgment behind that. So, um, the data set can, came only with a pair of questions and the corresponding class labels, and the evaluation criteria was based on log loss. So, you know, as usual, uh, we go through the typical analytical workflow, EDA, cleaning, data prep, feature generation, model building, evaluation. And this is just something, uh, uh, you know, what happens with, uh, on the Quora's website. If you type in a question there and it, it gives you a ranking of what are the closest, uh, most sim similar questions. And I think the, one of the reasons why they choose log loss was because they wanted to make sure that your predicted question, right, is closest, uh, your, your model has the closest uh, accuracy. Right? Not in terms of whether is it true or false, but you know, the confidence of you predicting that um, question is duplicate. Okay. So I'm going to just jump to what I did with the uh, beginning of this uh, to, to, uh, to prepare the data set. Um, I'm going to jump to the text feature generation and then quickly go through the models. So basically, with all the data that we have prov that they've provided, um, we start with uh, word and character count for each question. I mean, just uh, based on uh, intuition, right? Um, character counts and word counts of two similar sentences should be fairly close to each other. So that's an intuition-based kind of uh, feature generation. And then, of course, the next one will be share of matching words. So we try to find, hey, you know, what's the proportion of the words that appear on one sentence uh, matching the other sentence, and the higher the proportion, uh, intuitively, uh, the closer the match. Obviously, uh, we all know that um, that's not necessarily the case, but here we're trying to uh, generate as much features as possible. Now, um, one of the things that uh, I approached, I took it was not to do stemming, uh, to preserve the meaning of the tenses, right? And uh, I had a custom stop word list to preserve the keywords such as how, why, when, and where, because these are uh, fairly important when you begin the question with how and why, it's obviously different. So uh, the next uh, feature that we that generated that I used was the TF-IDF weightage. So TF-IDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. Basically, it just means that if a word that appears very rarely over a corpus, right, that word is likely to be pretty important, right? So intuitively, what we are saying, what we are saying is that questions with unique terms that appear in one question and not the other are thus less likely to be duplicates, right? So that's one of this uh, uh, feature that we generated. So here, the TF-IDF weightage, right, um, that matrix at the bottom. So these two questions, um, you get the um, TF-IDF weightage of every term, and then you calculate a score, right? You sum it up or multiply it or get a mean. Uh, it doesn't matter, as long as you generate many, many features out of it. So the next one is um, semantic similarity. So this is where um, it gets, um, I took the approach of trying to use WordNet um, from Princeton. So um, it's basically trying to find the semantic uh, distance between the two words from the sentences. Um, WordNet, uh, using, uh, we're using the synsets uh, to determine the length distance and hierarchy distance. So what is length distance? Length distance is basically the measure of the length of the shortest path in the semantic ontology between two synsets. So one word, uh, each word belongs to a synset, and how far are they from each other? Next is the hierarchy distance, the measure of depth of the ontology. The nodes closer to the root uh, are broader and have less semantic similarity. So what it means is that uh, we compare two sentences together, and for every single pair, right, what which, what is, what the, what best, every one of them, we create, uh, we do that semantic similarity lookup the length distance and hierarchy distance. Now you can see there are a lot of zeros there because um, WordNet doesn't um, capture a lot of the um, conjunctions, for example. So it gets zero. But some other words like um, 
what um, best. You know, these are, there, are, uh, there are sin sets for that, so you can get the similarities. So um, from this, right, um, we calculate the semantic similarity, and for these two sentences, the score is, say, for example, uh, in this case, it's 0 0.6674, which is all right, you know, uh, that intuitively it looks all right, right, in terms of score. Next, we took also the word order similarity. Uh, similar to uh, the previous approach, um, what the order of the words appearing in the two sentences, and then we compare that, again using a word net. And the word order similarity is about 0 0.67, so that's intuitively right. So what I've, been, what I've been doing here is really generating a lot, a lot of different features, trying to find out as many features as possible to pass into the convolutional neural network uh, that I built. Now, the next one is the um, word-to-back embeddings to determine word similarity. So basically what, uh, again, we do a word-by-word -word vector comparison. So this word compared to that word, and I'm using the word-to-vec similarity score. Okay, so the word-to-vec uh, was trained using Google, uh, the Google's 3 billion word uh, data set. So I loaded that in and then uh, run the word-to-vec similarity score, and then we compute um, uh, you know, what's the score between every one of these words. So what you get will be a uh, matrix vector like that. So I was actually quite inspired by Martin when he said that for CNNs, everything's an image. So um, you know, following that approach, we uh, visualize that particular matrix. And I think intuitively, you can also see that it, it's sort of like right, where the ones with the red dots are obviously the matching words on the axis itself. And then it gets spread out. The rest of the weights get spread out. So you can see the visualization. So here, um, for CNNs, typically we use a very well, um, very nice square. So I chose 20 by 28 following the mince example. I mean, it's, it's, it's just easy to do, that's all, right? But you can have any other dimensions as well, as we're gonna sh I, I will show you later, okay? So these are some of the text feature generations just to understand and see uh, whether or not they are intuitively correct. First one um, is a duplicate. Does waste training really work? Do waste cinches really work? If so, how? So that's the image looks like. Uh, the duplicate one, the other one, is uh, what's the most beautiful French songs and what are some good French songs? So you, you would see that, hey, um, it gets a bit interesting here because no longer are you seeing that dimension, that center line across the image itself, but you're seeing a very different uh, pattern coming out. So intuitively, hey, maybe CNNs would be able to try to extract out uh, uh, these features and use it to uh, you know, do the prediction. The last one is, um, it, uh, um, it's not a duplicate, it says, how do bartenders actually become bartenders in California? And how do bartenders actually become bartenders in Texas? So every word is the same, uh, the position is also the same, only the last word is different, and that changes the entire meaning of the sentence. So uh, this is something which uh, potentially uh, a lot of the neural networks may not be able to solve, but uh, maybe sequence to sequence might, might might be able to resolve this. So anyway, um, what, we, the, what next we did was to combine two word vectors, the word to word vector similar vector, with the other uh, features that we have previously created into another matrix representation. So in this case here, we, I converted it to a 24 by 33, uh, 972 pixel representation. Now, with this thing, right, you will see that the whole um, spatial thing just splits out. It's no longer a very nice dimensional angle. And I intuitively that's okay because uh, we are expecting the CNN to be able to identify features even if it's um, not so nicely aligned and to be able to use that to um, build the model. So I'm going to show you a bit of code now and then see what the results are. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as the usual um, mandatory uh, initialization, so we do a bit of EDA, right? And then you can see that uh, generally from the text itself, the training set, 
you've got a lot of words, right? Number of oracle prints of a question and number of questions, meaning to say that um, many questions are unique in itself, but there are a lot of repeated questions in the training data set. So that gives uh, some sense of comfort that, hey, okay, this is probably trainable and usable. Next, uh, we visualize the word distribution, okay? And this uh, distribution is actually quite uh, important. Uh, well, I, I found that this distribution actually uh, gave us a lot of information because as you can see here, um, the highest frequency of it is at 10 words. It means most sentences were, most questions were 10 words long and it tails off towards uh, 30. So because of that, right, I think choosing a 28 by 28 matrix uh, would cover most of all the dimensions of the questions. But that leaves a problem. So if I'm a 20 by 28 matrix, what do I do with sentences that are 10 words long, right? So um, the, what, the approach that I took was I did a zoom. Basically, I just zoomed the image to populate out the various, um, uh, to try to fill the vectors instead of uh, padding it with zeros. <coughs> right, so the, the, the mandatory data cleansing and pre-processing, I won't bore everyone here. And this, um, okay, so I just loaded the pre-built um, data. So you can see it here, um, this is the question itself, um, original question, uh, stemmed, um, the tokenized and stemmed uh, question set, the word counts, um, normalized word counts, the percentage word match, um, semantic similarity, and the word order similarity. And then followed by the various um, uh, TF-IDF weights. I took a sum as well as a median, okay? So this is just another uh, view of the data itself. Um, so this is before I created the image. So after loading the pre-built, uh, for this case, in this example here, I pre-built the data set, so I've loaded it um, because it's really, really big. And then this is after all the uh, word-to-back uh, translations, all right? And then let's look at some uh, EDA further and see whether which of the features are actually usable. So word map percentage, that was the one where we had uh, intuitively decided to take a look at perhaps maybe um, the number of words, similar words across sentences uh, would, in, you know, would indicate whether it's duplicate or not. So here, uh, it looks like word map percentage may be useful because you can see a very differentiation of the uh, the labels, which is between duplicates and not duplicates. So word order similarity, it looks um, okay as well, uh, might be useful. Um, semantic similarity looks pretty good because, uh, and this was, the word order similarity and semantic similarity was based off the word net, uh, 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 yeah, the word net to get the figures. All right, so, right, so now, we took another um, visualize the word to back similarity matrix, and you can see here, uh, in this case here, this is uh, not a duplicate question, right? But this is obviously a very long question. So as you can see, there's no, um, it's all a lot of uh, features here and there, which, uh, yeah, perhaps intuitively, it looks like, yes, it wouldn't give you any duplicates. It's not a duplicate uh, sentence. So here, um, we proceed to build the CNN. Uh, in this case here, I'm just using a, Convolution Neural Network with three layers uh, instead of the uh, standard two layers, right? Uh, applying one hop encoding to the label so that you know it's easy for uh, the TensorFlow to just quickly do the uh, uh, comparison, right? In this case here, I partition the data set, um, 80% and 20%, 80% training, 20% validations. Um, in, the actual, in the actual competition itself, the uh, training cases were uh, huge, right? About 400 over 1,000 uh, training cases, and the, the test set was about a million over records. So in this case, for this particular um, code presentation, I just uh, took a very, very small sample. So we initialized the variables, uh, image size of 24 by 33. Um, what I found was that um, batch size and number of epochs actually had a lot of uh, in, uh, influence on, on my model, right? Um, if, I, if I did a, a very small batch size, my prediction, my, my accuracy wasn't very good. If I had a way up of 300 and 350, 500, my accuracy was 
pretty bad as well. So um, after a couple of experiments, um, I started in around 250 with an epoch of 20. So that seemed to work for this particular data set. Right, then uh, we set up the variables and helper functions here. So we define uh, some helper functions to create the various layers of the convolution neural network. Um, yep, standard max pooling of two by two. All right, and so we've created the first uh, convolution neural network layer. Um, the second layer, the first layer input was a three by three matrix. All right, so it's a small, going to uh, iterate through the entire image on a three by three matrix. Second layer is a five by five, and the third layer, which was really an experiment, um, because when I started out with two layers, the accuracy was was okay, but when I so when I added another layer, it, it went up a, a notch better. So uh, I stuck with the third layer, and five by five, and then sixty-four. Um, I didn't go to one twenty-eight, right? Because uh, the training time was just simply too long. So I just stuck with sixty-four, and then uh, the dense fully connected layer was then a three by five by sixty-four, uh, nine hundred sixty uh, neurons uh, uh, dense layer. Yeah, one zero two four was my initial test. So yeah, please ignore that. And then you drop out layer and then a readout layer. So um, now the next we have to define the loss function, regularizers, optimizers, and evaluation functions. Here you have a uh, just standard softmax cross entropy with logits, um, and then regularizers cross entropy. Um, the learning rate we create a variable learning rate, and then I'm using the atom optimizer, which I found was probably the best. It was supposed to be best. The momentum and gradient descent wasn't wasn't very good, but um, atom optimizer gave. Uh, pretty good results. And then after that, of course, your evaluation and accuracy. So as with any um, uh, classification algorithm, uh, I mean, accuracy is just uh, one measure, one metric, and it can be a very misleading metric. So uh, we need to take into account the uh, precision and recall, as well as the F measure, just to compare against the different models. Um, and then one thing, what I found was really easy to do, I think even with TensorFlow, right, I'm not talking about Keras yet, but um, you know, the ability to add um, your summaries so that you can visualize what's happening in your neural network as it trains uh, was really easy. And I'm a beginner with TensorFlow, and you know, this didn't take me too long to figure it out. So uh, I'm sure um, yeah, you all can do much better. But um, it's, it's, it was surprisingly easy. I thought it would be like rocket science, something like that. So you create a, a log writer um, to capture all the summaries as it goes through the, the network, and then you can visualize it um, using your um, uh, the tensor board. And then we execute the graph. So here um, I executed it. I, okay, I stopped halfway because it was taking too long. Um, but as you can see here, um, you know, the accuracy was improving. Uh, and let me show you what it looks like in the um, on the tensor board. Okay, so is that okay? Right. So as you can see here, the accuracy was uh, was going up, and um, just just very basic feature sets, you're getting about eighty percent accuracy, and that's that's pretty good. Uh, surprisingly, um, for me, when I tried the um, uh, the Kaggle favorite, which is the XG Boost. Um, <laughs> right, it took me, uh, I think, about three and a half days on training the uh, on the sixteen core uh, CPU, and then to get about eighty three percent. Right, so um, I got this in about four hours, four to five hours. So I I was pretty surprised. Right, um, error rates going down. It's still not. Um, um, good. It, it's like still at 0 0.3. Um, I mean, the, cap the competition guys actually got it down to 0 0.1, right? So they were using a lot of other um, models, not just one model in itself. They had about five or ten different models all uh, lined up together. So, um, yeah. Um, one thing to note about, again, classification algorithms, right, um, is that precision and recall. So here, as you can see here, the recall, uh, so I plateaued around um, eight and a half. Uh, which is not too bad, um, but the precision was too fairly lacking. I think this, this uh, signals a problem with the model itself. Either the model's not really fully, um, uh, couldn't differentiate uh, between uh, false positives and false negatives and true positives and true, true negatives. 
right? And then the F measure, F measure was not too bad at 2.0. Now, the one thing good about TensorFlow also is the ability, uh, the TensorBot, sorry, ability to add different dimensions of your statistics to your model. Uh, in this case here, I just visualize a simple confusion matrix, right? Um, I do apologize, it's just a black and white image. Um, but I did this a very, very last minute. So as you can see here, the, the dimensions are prediction, and this, this is a label, your target, and this is your predicted, and this is one, this is zero. So you can see here, a lot of the, the model actually uh, was able to learn how to uh, detect not duplicates, right? Uh, I need to say questions which, which were very different, but they didn't do so well for questions that were duplicates, right? And this is to be expected given the, data, the current uh, data set and model, right? So that's the TensorBot. And then um, at the end of the day, um, yeah, yeah, you evaluate one with the validation set. Now, the other thing I was uh, gonna experiment a bit was the CNN with SBM. Um, so uh, at the end of the, um, at the max pool, oh, sorry, not the max pool, at the dense layer, right? Instead of going back to the uh, output, you move that entire layer, the inputs into uh, SVM, right? So the 960 neuron layer, push it into an SVM and see what the outputs will look like. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to complete this experiment yet, um, but I, I anticipate it would be a better, might be a better result. So anyway, back to the, back to the presentation. So a um, couple of things also to note about CNNs, which I've observed. Um, uh, imbalanced data set and balanced data sets. So um, I I'm not sure, but my experience with this particular um, uh, exercise was that um, as with any other neural networks, uh, uh, having a balanced data set is very, very important, right? So um, imbalanced data set, you can see here, it gets 83.6%, right? It might seem very good, um, but actually it's, uh, very, it's due to the learning the negatives rather than identifying the positives. So that 83% is actually a very misleading figure. When you balance the data set, um, the accuracy drops, uh, but your error rate uh, drops as well. So it's actually a, a, a less uh, fitted uh, model, right? So the, um, both models suffer from uh, poor precision, but relatively high recall. Uh, and these are probably due to common NLP issues. So a couple of NLP issues that uh, typically needs to be looked at, right? Not just from a, a TensorFlow modeling perspective, but more from a approach would be uh, training set labeling. So as you can see here, um, uh, this question here, what's your new year resolution for 2017? What are some of the best new year resolutions for 2017? So obviously these are not duplicates, right? I mean, it, but the human labeled it as duplicate. So uh, it is, uh, very subjective. The data set itself is very subjective. So what you're learning, that, that model itself um, may be subject to all these biasness, uh, which you know, we need to somehow have to find a way to deal with. And obviously the third one was the name entities. Um, these are obviously not duplicate, but according to the neural network that the CNN that was trained, it, it was a duplicate. So these are some of the issues that causes. So what are the possible improvements that I think uh, uh, from my learnings here? Um, I, th I think we need to add NERs um, so to identify duplicate questions with high structural similarity but different question targets, meaning to say, you know, what, how do I be a bartender in Chicago? How do I be a bartender in California? Chicago and California, that's uh, name entity recognition that we need to build in. Next, uh, tune CNN hyperparameters. I think filter shapes um, helped a lot. Um, my front, uh, my first layer was five by five. It didn't get too good a result. Uh, when I changed to three, point, three by three, um, my, the accuracy as well as the error rate was much better. Stride size, currently the stride size is one. Um, you can, you know, uh, according to the literature out there, it can be one and two, and it's something for you to try out. Pulling layers, uh, two by two, or no, no pulling layers. The other thing that um, I chanced upon also was the channels, all right? So currently right now, that that, um, the input channel is only one layer. So it's only one channel uh, on, a, on the 960 pixel image. Um, you could add another channel and you could apply another filtering, uh, like for example, a solo filter. And if you apply a solo filter, you can see the third image there. It kind of like uh, able to detect edge detection of certain features of the image itself. Uh, I know CNNs are supposed to do that already, um, 
but something which maybe you know uh, adding another channel, another perspective might help the network. But this is an experiment that I'm still working on, and that's it. Um, so um, there are some of these are some of the links uh, which have been helpful uh, in my research as well as helping me to point in the right direction. And you can download the source code from my GitHub account. All right, that's it. Thank you. Uh, OK.